Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for this opportunity, another opportunity and time to spend together in your word and feasting on your word together. We are so aware of our limitations. We so long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow indeed in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. The book of Acts is written by the Holy Spirit as with all the rest of the Word of God. He used a, a human agent, and in this case it was Luke. In fact, Luke, a Gentile, wrote more of the New Testament than any, anyone else. The Holy Spirit, uh, being the author, carrying Luke along as he was directed and in, inspired by God Almighty. We're not studying Luke's theology, nor uh, are we uh, looking at Luke's intelligence. We are studying the Word of God, one unified whole with one author. In Matthew, we see the Lord Jesus Christ through the eyes of the Holy Spirit as King. Uh, in Luke, we see Him as man. Because uh, if He's not man, He's not our kinsman redeemer. And if He's not God, we're not redeemed and we have the presentation of the Word of God that God Almighty, uh, Creator of heaven and earth, became incarnate in human flesh in order not only to become our kinsman, but also to become our Redeemer, giving Himself for us on the cross, dying in our place. In John, we see the Lord Jesus Christ portrayed by the Holy Spirit as God Almighty. He's the King of Israel. He's uh, the servant of men. He's man as well as God, and He's God Himself. The Gospel of John, properly studied and, and properly understood, is, a, is really a devastating uh, uh, treatment against uh, any of the modern theologies that would attack the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of Acts, it seems as though that we have one portion of the New Testament that doesn't fit. You know, it seems to, at least to some degree, to be filled with conflict. And it seems vastly different than the first four Gospels, uh, the first four books of the New Testament. In the Gospels, we had a beautiful, unified whole. Uh, it all seemed to uh, fit together quite nicely, uh, really fit together beautifully. And then all of a sudden, as we read through, the book of Acts, well, it seems as though we've departed from the divine, and I'm going to suggest to you folks that the Holy Spirit is allowing us to see in the book of Acts how that men look at Christ. In Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, we were vividly told how God looks at Christ, but in the book of Acts, among other things, we have a a glimpse into how man looks at the Lord Jesus Christ, and things really aren't nearly as neat. Imagine it if you can. Here you are in uh, the land of Egypt, and God says, you know, well, I've got great news for you. I have fabulous news for you. I, God Almighty, am engineering your deliverance. I'm going to take you out of the land of Egypt, uh, take you out of slavery, I'm going to take you uh, from a land where you are, in many cases, you're required to eat garbage, and I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. I suppose we could have all gotten together, you know, uh, got our, just, and just gotten really excited, I guess, you know, whatever childhood is left in us. We'd, we'd begin to dream at night about what flowing with milk and honey meant. You know, you know, of course, that would be sports cars, and, and for some, it'd be golf carts to others, and, and who knows what. Yet, 
What we see in actual reality are the children of Israel in the wilderness with bugs and heat and cold and nothing all that great to eat. And surely, by all means, from man's viewpoint, the, the greatest miracle in all the Bible is the preservation of the nation of Israel in the wilderness. Now, sometimes in the urgency of presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ, many a Christian is, is prone to, to paint a picture that is vastly different than that of reality. You know, we'll find out in uh, the book of Acts, for example, that the disciples, though they begin talking to the Lord about restoring the kingdom, it won't be very long uh, until we find that they're going about uh, daily exhorting the brethren with much suffering. And so in the book of Acts, we have a beautiful similarity between the wilderness experience as presented by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the wilderness experience of the Christian. I think that we will see before we get to the end of Acts, if we get there, that's questionable, uh, that when Paul comes to Jerusalem, the leaders of the church were unwilling to call Paul what God called him. Saul uh, was, became Paul. I think in, in, the, in the main that that's, that's probably characteristic of, of Christianity. We are unwilling to look at each other with God's eyes. God renamed Peter, God renamed Paul, but the, Christ, the Christians said, Brother Saul, you know, there, there's thousands of Christians in Jerusalem, Saul, and you know, you're quite a voice in the Christian community. So, so what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to enter into the temple. And it would seem to me that we have Paul entering into the temple to do what he wrote in the book of Galatians should not be done. However, I simply point out in all of that mess and in the compromise of his own life, we have him arrested and, and one begins to wonder then, you know, where are the thousands of, of Christians in the city of Jerusalem that you would expect would rally to the cause of one of their own? They didn't appear. In fact, we have Paul write that Almost everyone uh, had forsaken him. Only Luke is with him. Uh, some left him because they loved this present world more than the Lord Jesus Christ. Others, apparently because of his criminal record. But we find that, that what we would have anticipated is a messy Paul, you know, accepting Christ and, and his life transformed you know, where that he, he becomes a supremely successful businessman. You know, marvelous testimony in the Christian community. You know, he lives to 91, age 91, and dies instantly of a heart attack, you know. So he has no suffering in his life at all. Beautiful illustration of what redemption by grace really means. No, that is not true. And it seems to me that many times in the presentation of the gospel message, we insidiously infer that if one would just accept Christ and yield to God, well, then everything would be beautiful. When the truth of the matter, dearly beloved, is there's a great spiritual, well, there's a great, there is a great spiritual vitality in that, but the experience that we are about to witness in the book of Acts is by no means what one would, would call from a human standpoint beautiful. I'll suggest to you that when we get to the experience of Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, we often call it a, a conversion experience. I, even I do that. And, and uh, you know, and so there, thereby inferring that that had Paul had a heart attack when he was 18 years old and died, he had gone to hell. 
Now, I don't think that you could support that from this book at all. He was separated from his mother's womb, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God in his sovereignty did not and would not have allowed Paul to die at an, at an early age. But had he died at an early age, you know, he wasn't a pagan. He wouldn't have gone to hell. He would have been in heaven. He wasn't redeemed on the road to Damascus, folks. He was enlightened, but he, surely not redeemed. And God revealed himself to him that he was a chosen vessel, but he had been a chosen vessel from before the day that he was born. You know, from what little we can find in history, which isn't a whole lot, Paul, Paul was apparently a very wealthy man, unquestionably a married man, he had to be, to be a member of the Sanhedrin. And it would appear then that when he received this tremendous enlightenment on the road to Damascus, you know, his home broke up, uh, he, he lost his money, so, so that a man who was extremely wealthy and apparently could have paid every ma working man's wage in the city of Jerusalem for over a year was now mending tents in order to pay his bills. You know, from our standpoint, the standpoint of our human frame, we would say that Paul lost a tremendous amount by walking with Christ, and I believe the Holy Spirit has properly placed the book of Acts here so that you and I might realize that our citizenship is in heaven, it's not here. That our dreams are there, not here. Our successes are there, not here. Our hopes are there, and not here. So the Holy Spirit em employs Luke here, who's an, an accomplished author, called the Beloved Physician, Apparently, he's led of the Lord and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this as well. And he's going to explain all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, I think in the very first verse, the Holy Spirit tips us off that, that we don't have the ultimate end of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a look at its beginning. I don't suppose there is uh, any human way, uh, any, any human at any time in all of history who would have planned to build any kind of an organization or present any kind of, of a theology that would have done it as poorly as Christ appeared to do. You know, choosing a rag tag group of a motley group of 12 uh, disciples one of whom wound up betraying him, betraying him and then and then leaving them alone and expecting something to come out of it, come of it you know uh, the truth of the matter folks is that he left them with the holy spirit you know so what would appear from the human standpoint to be utter defeat is in fact the body of christ built upon the finished work of the lord jesus christ and here the Holy Spirit is going to show us its beginning. And from every possible concept from the human mind, its beginning is terrible. God isn't going to do it the way that we do it. You know, even today, many a Christian uses an argument that's difficult to, de to defeat. I mean, you know, I mean, if you're going to do it for Christ, shouldn't it be the best? Shouldn't it be the most beautiful building that you could possibly build? The most expensive organ that you could possibly buy? The most elegant talent that you can possibly assemble? I mean, after all, we're doing it for God Almighty, right? You know, just look at the cathedrals and the, and the monuments all around the world that have been carved out in the name of Christianity and Jesus Christ. We have a fantastic illustration of man's attempts to do something great for God. When the example that we have from our Savior 
was one of simply surrendering himself to God and coming to do the will of the Father. I question whether the Christian community today is really all that interested in doing the will of the Father, you know, but rather inter in interested in promoting something that would look great, that would uh, have some kind of a voice in politics and, or whatever, and accomplish what we might call Christian goals. You know, given the opportunity, I'm persuaded that a, a great number of, of professing Christians would like to control the legislature and the regulations of our country so that we'd be Christian in, in the way that we dress, the way that we eat, the way that we live, the way that we conduct our entertainment and so forth. I don't think anything could be further from the Scriptures. You know, we could uh, easily spend hours thinking about what Jesus Christ our Lord knew about germs and, and you know, and what, what cleanliness meant in childbirth and, and in medical operations, yet, yet He never mentions it. You know, you could have told the, the, the physicists and the mathematicians all about the table of elements you going to tell me that, that it didn't bother him, that there were flies on the food? Why didn't he spend his life teaching people, you know, that they ought to build screen doors to keep the flies out, you know, and get rid of those pesky mosquitoes? You know, where, where they could cut down on disease and they, they could reduce the, the death rate in, in children and, you know, tremendous effect on society, you know, medically, physically, mathematically, scientifically, never mentioned any of that. Surely, Jesus Christ ought to be concerned with Nero's morals. No, he wasn't. Or at least if he were, he never mentioned it. It would seem to me that he should have spent his, his life cleaning up the filthy bureaucracy and the priesthood, you know. And though charlatans, these fake charlatans in the name of God Almighty would say that, that your offering was not cleansed, therefore you had to trade it in on one that was cleansed at great cost to you, and then, and then they ran your lamb through the back door and brought him out and sold him to the next sucker who didn't have a clean sacrifice. He knew that was going on. He even knew that Judas was, was dipping into the till, yet he never said anything about any of those things. In our past study in Corinthians, we were called to proclaim the message of reconciliation. Dearly beloved, Christ did not come to keep flies off of people's food, but to redeem them from hell. And we have a treatise of what He began both to do and to teach. I think the first several verses are utterly fantastic. You know, who, who knows who ran out to that empty tomb? You know, when the scribes and the Pharisees and, and even the high priests tried to get the apostles to, to shut up about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they knew, they knew that Christ had risen from the dead because any one of them could have walked down there to look inside the tomb. You t you're going to try to tell me that no scribe, no priest, no Pharisees was interested enough in what those disciples were saying to walk out there and look inside that empty tomb? Or to look inside that tomb and see a dead body? Everybody knew where it was. Now, I may not know till I get to glory, and I may not even know then, but it surely wouldn't surprise me, not in the tiniest bit, that Pilate went out and looked at the, that tomb. 
I'm told that by many infallible proofs, he showed himself as risen from the dead. Now, let's think about that for a minute. The resurrection from the dead. You know, you, you can look at, uh, at, at the guy and say, he's alive. I just had dinner with him. I, I talked to him. You know, I shook hands with him. You know, that man's alive. And now he's dead. I have the testimony of soldiers that he was dead. Men who had, had seen many and many a corpse, probably participated in making many of, of, of those corpses. Guy's dead. We know he's dead. We, we, didn't, we didn't even break his legs. He's dead. I know, I know that he was alive. I ate the, the Passover supper with him. I watched him break bread. I talked to him. I shook hands with him. I walked with him. And then I, I watched him on the cross. And I took him down from that cross. And I wrapped his corpse with linen. And I saturated it with roughly 300 pounds of, of ointments and and I laid it in the tomb, and then I saw him again. Now, the only problem with the human mind is that it is not unusual to see somebody alive, and it's, it's really not unusual, particularly if you attend funerals, to see somebody that's dead. The only problem is if you see them alive, then dead, and then alive again. It's that sequence that staggers the mind of man. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. You know, we disciples, we, we've had every dream collapse, everything we had, had concluded about the work of Christ. Man, we, we've seen, we saw the water changed into wine. We've seen the, the lame walk, we, the dead raised up. You know, he, he could have had an army three times as big as Rome, you know. You know, use any weapons he wants and he dies on the cross. You know, that would seem from a human standpoint to be pretty much be the end of it all. But when we begin the book of Acts, he's risen from the dead. And whatever these men might have lost in, in the way of enthusiasm or of worship and in the, the utter desolation of their dreams must have been restored immediately when they finally grasped the truth that he's actually risen from the dead. That's an interesting contrast because in the Gospel of John, we begin with God Almighty being made flesh and we end with his uh, rising from the dead. Now at that peak, the, the resurrection from the dead, we go through the book of Acts and we wind up with the death of the leading apostle, Paul one who wrote 13 of the New Testament books. I stubbornly believe this is God's book and God's the author, but I'm told by the Holy Spirit in Colossians that God chose Paul to complete the Word of God and tradition sees him die in the city of Rome. It would... Uh, it would appear as though we're simply thrown back to defeat again. Would it not be reasonable for these disciples who had gone through such a, a crushing experience and now suddenly vitalized by the knowledge of His resurrection, would it not be reasonable for them to assume that, you know, man, we're really in high gear now. I mean, when we thought every dream had collapsed, and now we know that's not true. We'll soon see them asking Him in the sixth verse, will you at this time restore the kingdom? You know, they'd, they'd been looking for that before. And now 40 days after His resurrection, that's what they want to happen. And so the book begins with a, a fabulous shout of victory and it seems to end, at least from man's viewpoint, in defeat. You know, the Gospel of John began in defeat and ended in victory. 
well, maybe I shouldn't put it that way, but, but when Almighty God becomes incarnate in human flesh, that is a great step down. And when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, rises victorious from the dead, there's a fabulous shout of victory at the end of, of the Gospel of John. And when we look from God's perspective, we see a fabulous victory when now that the Holy Spirit gives us just a moment to look at the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ as it applies to our walk, our, our fellowship, our, our human relationships, well, the shout of victory seems to be gone. Dearly blood, what we would have liked to have seen I think, is a super victory in the life of Paul sometime before he dies. I mean, you know, where he, he's voted a man of the year, the most outstanding Christian of his, of his time, of his generation, and whatever awards we might want to give him, yet the life of Paul seems absolutely in contrast to not only what we would have expected, but what we even hold out today for those who may accept Christ. Yet in the book of Timothy, the Holy Spirit tells me that Paul is an example of every Christian redeemed by the grace of God in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Paul is your example and mine. In Matthew, we read about the, the sowing of the seed, that, that, that which fell on stony ground, which sprung up with joy but, but soon withered away. A walk with the Lord Jesus Christ is one where we will uh, consistently be taught to trust Him, to trust God, in, in whatever it takes God to do that, even if it's, it's to move, move us away from being rich in this world to the, the mending of tents. The Christian walk is one of resting and trusting in God. And, and dearly beloved, that seems so contrary to what we would conclude as, as we begin this study of the book of Acts. With many infallible proofs, we know that He's victorious. He's risen from the dead. You know, hey, it's all over, okay? Job's done. Let's restore the kingdom of God. We have a powerful Redeemer. We have a powerful God. Why? Why in human comprehension would it be necessary for a man of Paul's stature to wind up dying as he, di as he did? Dying the way that he died. We have the Holy Spirit directing Luke to speak about the beginning of the application of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Christ came to die in our place. He did that. That's a finished transaction. And we have no right, no scriptural right to hold out to anyone that if they would do something, if they would just do something, God would redeem them. Folks, God has redeemed everybody He's going to ever redeem in Jesus Christ. And our responsibility is to proclaim that redemption. You know, one looks at the life of Paul and says, you know, boy, you know, if, if he's redeemed and headed for heaven, it might have been better if nobody had ever even told him about it because he never would have suffered the life that he suffered and, and he, he still would have gone to heaven. And right away, the, the pagan bent of our mind becomes apparent. For somehow or other, we are convinced that if we could get to heaven without doing anything, that's, that's the way we'd go to heaven. Today, we are, are still influenced by pagan theology that redemption and heaven are the product of human works and human merit, human production. And if we could figure out where the, that dividing line is, we do only what we have to do to get to heaven. You don't have to do anything. Jesus did it all. Paul's redemption is not, not dependent 
in any way upon anything Paul did. Your redemption is not dependent in any single way on any response from you or, or anything you do. But your walk is. And the question, the question comes down to a Redeemer who by many infallible proofs showed His victory over death, who then said, I do not intend to take you out of the system. I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them in the world. And He sends us forth to carry a message of reconciliation. A message of what God did when Jesus Christ died on the cross. He did not impute men's trespasses unto them, and He committed unto us the ministry of this reconciliation. Well, what if you are not redeemed? Your heart's blinded. You can't hear. What if you are redeemed? Well, then God has commanded light to shine in your heart, and you can hear. I don't have to decide whether you're redeemed or not. I would have hated to, uh, to have met Paul someplace and, you know, and said, boy, that guy, he's not redeemed. You know, he's headed for hell. I'd have been wrong. If God commanded the light to shine in your heart, it will shine. Our responsibility is not to say to people, uh, God would redeem you if. Our responsibility is to declare what God has done. This is what Jesus did. This is what God did. And He established it with many infallible proofs. And then He taught them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You know, it seems like it's a waste of time. A waste of time with only 40 days left. You know, I could have taught them about germs, about, about cleanliness and screen doors and the table of elements and calculus and the value of oil and and uh, you know, and, you know, they had plenty of it. Fuel injection systems, uh, you know, comprised of a, a complex set of electronics and sensors, or or or, or how about communication satellites? Okay, you know. God Almighty knew about all of that stuff and never told us about it. So I have to conclude that that which is supremely important in the, in the mind of my God are the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I believe the kingdom of God is an expression that speaks of that area where God is sovereign. Of course, He's sovereign in every area, but I'm talking about the area where His own children are involved in a relationship with Him. I do not believe that the kingdom of God includes the non-elect. It is an all-encompassing term in the Word of God that speaks of the elective plan of God of all ages in the matter of our redemption. That's where God is concerned. That is where God is concerned. I don't think God's concerned about the inflation rate or the, or the price of gasoline. I, I really I don't. I don't think he's concerned about the situation in the Middle East. He's got that under control. You know, that whether the Arabs are going to attack the Jews or vice versa, or whether we sell weapons to Israel or, or any of those important things, you know, that we tend to worry about. I don't see any concern in whether we, we, we get a tax cut or, or don't get a tax cut, whether we, we uh, increase or uh, social security or decrease social security but but man that's where the interest of society is when the interest of God dearly beloved is in the finished work of Jesus Christ I wonder if we took a personal inventory as Christians whether our interest would would fall in line with God's interest We know what the Bible says about worry. You know, I've sometimes been asked, you know, what do you think the dominant theme of the Word of God is? I'm always tempted to say the person and the work of Christ. 
I think most of you all know that I believe the dominant theme of the scriptures is the sovereignty of God. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, I see God declaring that He is a jealous God. There's no God like God. There is no rock like our rock. I am a jealous God. I will have no other gods before me, no other gods or idols before me. I believe this book speaks, first of all, of the power and the majesty of God. Not a genie that you can, you know, kind of just, you know, like rub the bottle the right way, like you can stroke him the right way and so that it'll do what you want done. But if you were to say to me, the dominant theme of this book is the finished work of Jesus Christ, you're not going to get any argument, much of an argument from me. You know, for surely you can't separate those two. If we properly understand the finished work of Jesus Christ, it cannot be understood separate, separate from an understanding of the abject sovereignty of God. But if you said to me the dominant theme of this book is, is, uh, is personal salvation and Christian uh, uh, morality, well, I'd have to disagree. It seems to me if the thing that God talks most about is the person and the work of Jesus Christ, then that's what I ought to talk most about. You know, it seems to me that I would do God not only an injustice, but it would be blasphemy, at least it is in my opinion, it is blasphemy to suggest that Jesus Christ's work is in, in reality not finished. That God is somehow just, you know, waiting upon some decision on your part. The Lord taught them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's the center of God's interest. That's the center of His attention and His work. Dearly beloved, we have no continuing city here. We are surely not involved in any kind of effort that will make this a heaven on earth or a paradise that, that we can be proud of. We are strangers. We are foreigners here. We're, we were sent here in the name of God to do the will of God, to proclaim the message of the finished work of Jesus Christ in reconciliation, though our hope is in glory. I believe that God is going to knock the props out of your life one after another and as many as He needs to until you come to realize that your hope is in Him, Christ, and Him alone. And that your citizenship is in heaven. The Lord taught them what He wanted to teach them. And it becomes apparent that this is not what they wanted to be taught. And it's, it seems clear to me that what we're really interested in today is a program, a process, a success whereby we can help usher in some kingdom, kingdom of God that, that we've imagined, one of our own imagination, one according to our own imagination. Not be yielded in a surrendered life which God can use in any way that He so pleases. You know, if He wants me unhappy, why not be unhappy? If He wants me sad, why not have me sad? If He wants me sick, why not sick? If He wants me well, I'm happy to be well. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, God doesn't want you that way, Steve. God wants you happy and well all the time and satisfied all the time. And folks, that is not anywhere near the truth. Paul was concerned about the infirmities that often came upon him. I have no idea what all those infirmities were, which ones were spiritual, which ones were physical, He couldn't, he couldn't walk to Walmart and get a pair of glasses. He might not, not have been able to, to see too well. He may have suffered from rheumatism and arthritis and God knows what else. We'd like to use some kind of uh, painless, I don't know, uh, 
Well, let me, I'll skip saying that. Dearly beloved, God presents us as servants yielded and surrendered to Him. I can't tell you how strongly I believe that we ought to get our desires in order, our desires, our priorities in order, our desires in line with God's, the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Christians today are focused on anything and everything but the will of God. I'm talking about Christians. Their interests seem to lie in, in, in everything. And there's so many attractions. There's so many de deceptions, enticements, so much sensationalism, sensualism, sen sensationalism. Oh, we love those videos. But to just take an honest step, take a step back at this particular time in which we're living and to focus entirely on His Word and to just immerse ourselves in His Word. Well, because that's, that's where our strength is, folks. And there may be coming a time real soon where we will depend upon that strength, the strength of God's Word to carry us through. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.